Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. In a few seconds, I'll be joined by Jeffrey Summers, and we're going to talk about the Russian state, the rise of Putin, and what it means in terms of the current war in Ukraine. Be back in just a few seconds. As Israel continues its bombing of Gaza, Russia continues its attack on Ukraine. Uh, These wars have some things in common, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Uh, We're going to talk about Ukraine, the uh, Russian invasion, and the rise of the state as led by Putin and, and what we make of it today. Now, joining us again to talk about this is Jeffrey Summers. If you haven't watched my uh, previous interviews with Jeff, you really should, because they help set this one up, and you'll find them in links just below. Um, Jeffrey Summers is a professor of political economy and public policy at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he also serves as a senior fellow at the Institute of World Affairs. In addition to his academic work, he's been published in outlets such as the Financial Times, the New York Times, Project Syndicate, The Guardian, The Nation, Social Europe, and often in Counterpunch. Thanks for joining me, Jeffrey. Oh, great to be here. So in the in the previous segments, we, we talk about the, the end of the Soviet Union, the beginning of the rise of, of this new version of Russia. Uh, we talk to some extent about the 90s. Um, but I left off the last interview asking a question, which I think leads to the, the issue of the rise of the oligarchs and the rise of the state under Putin. Uh, but but the question I was going left off with was, at the, as the '90s unfolded, certainly in the beginning of the selling of public assets, the, the big privatization that took place uh, after the fall of Gorbachev and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of assets were sold to individual Russians, many or most of whom had been in the party or certainly senior in the bureaucracy, which probably meant in the party. Um, And assets that might have been worth hundreds of millions, maybe even billions, were sold for two or three million, I'm told. Um, And and if I'm right about that, where did these people get two or three million? I mean, this, you know, nobody was supposed to have individually two or three million dollars entering the 90s. So what, what had happened just prior uh, to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, that there were such people? It's a good question, and it's a fascinating one, and one which I think can still see you probably uh, wearing concrete shoes and finding yourself at the bottom of a deep river if you ask too many questions <laughs> along this line of inquiry. Uh, but nonetheless, it is fascinating. Uh, under Joseph Stalin, actually, even under this period of totalitarianism, Uh, we actually saw periodically the rise of millionaires. Stalin, when he did discover them, had them typically shot. Uh, But nonetheless, you're absolutely right. We're not supposed to see uh, people in possession of much money during the Soviet Union. Nonetheless, it happens. Well, how so? Uh, First of all, I would uh, like to set this up just in terms of a brief political economy of the 1980s and 1990s and just very, very, very cursorily looking at the differences, again, between China and Russia and the very different trajectories that they took. You know, again, so thinking about how both of them played an essential role in the creation of this neoliberal globalized order that emerges in the 1980s out of the crisis of the 1970s, crisis being relatively low profits in uh, the Western uh, capitalist world. Just to rehearse uh, that uh, different set of trajectories and their importance for launching a 40-year period of profitability and uh, some prosperity for some in the world system thereafter, we have China playing this role of a large state with a massive reserve army of labor, a state which is strong, can impose its authority, can put in place the infrastructure that is needed, and it can bring in all of this industry from Western capitalist states 
uh, where labor costs had become uncompetitive, at least according to uh, their owners, and it provided a vehicle for restoring profitability within the global system by providing high quality manufactured goods at relatively low labor costs, uh, delivered efficiently onto markets. And of course, as we know, uh, China was able to actually use its leverage as a supplier of these essential uh, goods to get usually majority share, 51% plus ownership of many uh, joint ventures with foreign firms and to have significant degrees of technology transfer from abroad to them. So that puts them on this launching pad uh, for a mission to economic development and prosperity, which of course, as we know, over the past four decades, they've been wonderfully successful with. Something which I don't think anyone else could really do. They had a unique set of advantages at a specific point in history, which allowed them to leverage neoliberalism and globalization to this project of national development, uh, which delivered such fantastic results for them. By contrast, the Soviet Union was an entirely different animal. Uh, as much as living standards were not on a par with the richest countries in the world, they were nonetheless still too high in order to have a workforce which would be competitive in terms of the global uh, system and this desire to set up new production facilities and take advantage of uh, very low cost labor. Number one, there was not a lot of excess labor in uh, the Soviet Union at least not to the extent that there was in China. And again, it was far too expensive. But what did the former Soviet Union have, and especially Russia? Well, as we know, that was raw materials. And those raw material prices, when depressed from their very high levels in the 1970s, so we have to remember that the 1970s crisis not only was caused by too much competition, driving profits down, wages which kept going up, but also rising raw material prices. Well, in the 1980s, uh, the Soviet Union began to supply an increasing quantity of these raw materials at low prices. And this helped to return the global system to profitability. And of course, this continues in the 1990s. And this is why the 1990s are often referred to as the peak of neoliberalism, uh, the point where we had a unipolar world in which the United States uh, prevailed over the system almost without peer and competition, and profits were very, very high, and there was much prosperity. Now, getting us back to your question, well, how does Russia you know, fit into uh, this system as continuing to provide these raw materials. Well, as we had mentioned in our last talk, as the 1980s unfolded, and as we get the Gorbachev reforms, which were designed to restore some efficiency and competitiveness in the system within the Soviet Union, they had uh, exactly the opposite effect. Again, Gorbachev pursues this model of restoring or creating democracy. He's always got his uh, face in the works of Lenin. He's trying to figure out where the system went wrong and how to right it. He's convinced that more or less the recipes for uh, success are located there. And so we see this dramatic flourishing of uh, democracy at this time. And it was thought that this would also give rise to innovation and this would save the Soviet economy. Instead, it launches this period of rampant rent-seeking and theft. Uh, so it, it takes the tendencies that had emerged and fully flowered uh, of corruption uh, throughout the uh, late 1970s and through the 1980s and, you know, just throws gasoline on them. So it's in this environment that you get this new class of people that emerge that begin to accumulate capital. They create within the Soviet Union under Gorbachev 
things such as cooperatives. We s discussed this a little bit last time, these economic cooperatives, which were uh, kind of like subdivisions oftentimes within existing uh, enterprises. And the idea that Gorbachev had was that there were probably all sorts of goods and services that existing Soviet enterprises could deliver if they just had more freedom of latitude in which to act. Uh, so what they essentially did was to say, hey, guys, look, if you've got a factory that's producing you know, so many metric tons of uh, steel rebar uh, for construction, if you can do something else with that steel as well and bring it onto market and sell it at whatever market price uh, it will command, you can you know, keep those profits and and continue to find these new, uh, un uh, heretofore discovered uh, areas of need in, in the economy. So that's how it was supposed to work. So to do this, uh, the Soviet authorities also began allowing the creation of banks. Uh, to provide some of the capital needs of these newly emerging uh, cooperatives. And the money that was provided oftentimes for investment and expansion into certain areas was backed up by the state, by the government. So in a sense, this was a license to create money in the late Soviet Union and then to steal it if you chose. Now, how did you steal the money? Well, you had to turn it into a foreign hard currency and send it abroad. And we discussed this a little bit last time, that it was the KGB uh, that was tasked with this job of showing some of these new managers of or you know, managers of existing state enterprises that we're beginning to create uh, these cooperatives, how you, you dealt with international finance. And, and you know sometimes you, you might need to buy electronics from abroad or you know, whatever it was. And so you, you, you needed to engage international uh, finance uh, in order to do this. And so the, the KGB was the one area where the resident skills, knowledge existed of how to work uh, the system of banks, and especially offshore banks. And one has to remember that this was another element of overcoming the 1970s crisis of profitability, which was to begin avoiding tax, uh, um, and, you know, your, your tax bills. And so, you know, we see this really big explosion, especially in London, of the uh, offshore banking industry, which again, goes all the way back to the 1950s in terms of the euro dollar market and the need to deal with the intricacies of uh, rebuilding you know Europe uh, after World War II and you know Europe has all these countries and you, know, you can't have all these multinational companies getting taxed every time they cross the border so everyone kind of does a wink and a nod uh, to tax avoidance every time you know you cross the border that was more or less I think legitimate but they create in that process in the 1950s, the offshore banking uh, structures, which in the 1970s and the 1980s will be used for a much larger scale tax evasion and for all sorts of uh, dubious activities. So the, um, the, the KGB provides this skill set to this emergent class of managers and entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, they, they weren't always the new owners of these uh, uh, enterprises in the Yeltsin years. They did not always come uh, from within these enterprises. Some did of the type that I just referenced, uh, but others were you know, uh, figures in the Komsomol. So in other words, energetic, young uh, um, members of the Communist Party. They had a really great uh, uh, Soviet Union-wide network. They you know, were engaged in all these conferences all the time. They knew each other. And so they could use that same network for all sorts of, of uh, practices, uh, corrupt and otherwise, and they did. Uh, and then there were also you know, some academics of talent, often coming out of physics, uh, which today still produces 
along with philosophy, they have the two highest sets of standardized test scores for aspiring new students. So, you know, P and P, physics and philosophy, produces a lot of smart people. Some of them, you know, find their way into these activities as well. Some of them do things really, really simple, like selling flowers, of which in the Soviet Union, that was a really big deal. You know, you you were always bringing flowers for some occasion, you know, names day. You know, I mean, there well, were the same thing happened in the U.S. A lot of the people that studied physics wound up either in big tech or on Wall Street. Wall Street, right? Exactly. Yeah. Wall Street and tech. That's exactly right. So, you know, there, there were, you know, people who started off young, energetic, small, and from these rather humble beginnings, I mean, just through a lot of hustle, uh, ended up acquiring quite a bit of money that way as well. Not enough money to buy, you know, a state nickel company or something like this. You know, it would be worth the massive sum of money. But they, this is where we started to see some of the initial capital accumulation. So what I'm trying to lay out are the various ways in which this initial capital capital accumulation started. So it was with these uh, commercial banks that were set up, as I was explaining before. It was with these uh, 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 guys that got into these uh, entrepreneurial activities simple as, you know, again, selling flowers and honey at markets. And next thing you know, their operations uh, go big and, you know, they're, they're starting to operate across the entire width and breadth of the Soviet Union. And then I think I might have even have mentioned the case of Latvia last time, which became uh, really the hub of offshore banking activity for the post-Soviet uh, oligarchs that were looking to get their money then to places like New York and London. And of course, thinking about right. political economy and overcoming that uh, crisis uh, from the 1970s and maintaining profitability. In the 1990s, something like a full $250 billion comes out of Russia and ends up in the equity markets of New York alone. So that really boosts asset prices. And then, of course, you know, in London, we have to, you know, purchase all this real estate and all this. Right. Now, in the case of uh, 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 a place like, you know, Latvia, just to give a concrete example of, of how this initial capital accumulation could work, you know, we, we had, as I think I mentioned before, this bank called Parex, uh, which would go on to become the biggest uh, bank in Latvia in the 1990s up until the financial crash of 2008 wiped it out. But you had two enterprise and Komsomol members, young communists, and uh, they get their humble start by, again, just filling duffel bags full of rubles and taking the train and going between Riga, St. Petersburg, and Moscow. And what they discover is that on the street markets, there's different, it's ever so slight, but there's this arbitrage, different levels at which they can exchange this currency uh, for others. And, and that's how they get their start. And then I, I think as I indicated before, these guys then start the first official, they get the first official approval for a currency exchange within the Soviet Union in 1990. So they become then the clearinghouse for these cooperatives and some of these state managers who are running some of these cooperatives. Throughout the entire Soviet Union, the money's flowing into Riga. Uh, and, and you know, again, as I, I think I mentioned last time, I mean, they were not very uh, subtle. I mean, Parx used to have a, a, a sign at, on the front of its bank. Now, this would have been in the early 1990s after they then established a bank in addition to their Soviet era currency exchange. But when they dis, you know, create this bank, they have a, a, this sign that says, we take all currencies, we ask no questions. <laughs> you know, it's right on the sign in front. Uh, so, and, and then another one of their uh, signs, as I think I'd mentioned before too, was uh, you know, Riga were closer than Switzerland. <laughs> you know, so it, they, they, you know, they they had a bit of a sense of humor, and of course, they were also very direct about what they were doing. And and they both became you know people who ended up with uh, their net worth was estimated around eight hundred million dollars each. Now, uh, how this then unfolds in the nineteen uh, nineties uh, is that. Uh, you know, we had this privatization uh, period that begins, and and there were friends of ours like Boris Kogorlitsky, who is now in jail, uh, 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 just east of the Urals, for his criticisms of Putin's government. 
he, as I think I mentioned before too, was in the Moscow uh, City Council. Now it's called the Moscow Duma. And and uh, you know between 1990 and 1993, arguably the most democratic period in Russia's history. Uh, and he tried to expose what was going on. I think I may have mentioned this example before. Like so for instance, just to highlight, this is great. You know, public relations. I mean, Boris really was smart with this kind of thing. Just to highlight the level of theft. You know, he went to this one hotel in you know near the Kremlin that was being sold for next to nothing. And he just and Boris just had the the chandelier alone in that hotel appraised. And then he gave a, a speech saying that they are privatizing, selling this hotel for less than the chandelier is worth, <laughs> which was true. So that speaks to your point regarding the, uh, uh, the COPEX on the ruble. So so let me just jump ahead a bit. Um, so, at, so during this period, which is in the 90s, this is very chaotic, a grab by anyone who's got some capital can get hold of these private enterprises and get super rich, and they do. If I understand it correctly, at this point, the state, Yeltsin, uh, is, is fairly subordinate to the power of the oligarchs in the midst of all this chaos. Um, and, and when Putin comes to power um, over the years, does that relationship then change? Because it seems like now we're at a point where the oligarchs are prob- are subordinate to the state to a large extent, and and, and Putin has been able to establish uh, the state as the most powerful force, and the oligarchs better get along with it. I mean, and if I'm right about that, how does that process take place? Well, you're absolutely right about that, Paul. And I remember some of these resentments that started to be expressed. A, a friend of mine uh, used to be the head of. Uh, publishing, which in effect was all information for the Soviet Republic of Latvia during Gorbachev's uh, period. And and she started reporting to me in the late 1990s that the KGB guys were getting really restless and they were getting, uh, frankly, pissed off uh, about what had transpired in the 1990s, not because the, the country had been sold out, but because they didn't get theirs. You know, there's an interesting thing as well. You, you know, the show The Americans. I've been re, I've been rewatching it because I think it's one of the best series that's ever been on TV, uh, especially and, and shockingly nuanced for an American network dealing with Soviet spies in the United States. Uh, but in the we're up to the last season now, rewatching it, and, and there's a split in the KGB, pro Gorbachev and anti Gorbachev, and with the Anti Gorbachev saying these reforms, especially democratization, are going to lead to the end of the Soviet Union. Um, well, in some ways, I guess maybe they did. I don't know. It certainly was followed by the end of the Soviet Union. Um, but this kind of split in the KGB uh, that thought democratization was a big mistake. Um, it, it, does Putin come out of there? No. Uh, he's really, to my mind, a very distinctive uh, figure because he bridges so many different groups. And that that is his tremendous advantage or has been his tremendous advantage is that he he both understood so many different groups and he was seen as credible with so many different groups. And by who do I mean by that? Uh, so he gains credibility with the military who definitely comes out of that wing of you know, this is, has been a huge disaster, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, the West is going to just run roughshod over us. And that's the message that they're telling him all along. Uh, and, and you know, you're, you're, you know, we're really seeing the country being uh, screwed, and these oligarchs are, you know, the ones that have done this to us, along with, you know, the West. And then there are uh, the oligarchs, and so in other words, we were referencing Yeltsin, and he was both um, you know, somebody who could not control the oligarchs, absolutely right about that, but he was also not so much seeking to control them. In other words, as they used to call uh, the members of his family, they were the family and they were oligarchs themselves. So they partook of, of this process. And you know, there are lots of reports, of course, that Yeltsin, especially at the end of his life, 
you know, just knew that everything had gone south and wrong and, you know, it was a disaster. And he really felt that somehow he was going to be able to create this prosperity rush. He was a very simple guy. He really didn't understand political economy. You know, one of the ideas that he had, again, was just that, you know, Russia was just supporting all these bums and the other republics. And if we could just cut them off from Russia's great wealth, well, you know, boy, were they going to get rich? And by the way, the Ukrainians thought the same bloody thing. You know, they thought that, boy, once they cut themselves off from, you know, these other republics in the Soviet Union, you know, sky's the limit, given uh, the Black Earth Belt and all the industry in the Donbass. Uh, so, you know, these really primitive ideas regarding political economy that they held. But so we then get into this new period, of course. I mean, uh, Putin is uh, 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 somebody who sees this meteoric rise in terms of his career, as we know, you know, but comes out of apparently nowhere. And I remember, you know, this at the time, uh, everyone was just like, what the hell happened here? You know, how did this guy situate himself into this position of power? Well, you know, it, some of it, the story has to do with the role that he played in, in St. Petersburg, to, you know, serving as the deputy to the, the mayor and being very, very super loyal. And Yeltsin picked up on that, that, you know, this was a guy you could trust completely, that to him, loyalty was everything and that he would protect you against principle or anything else. So that made him uh, very attractive in, in many ways and just competence. You know, we, whatever one thinks about Putin, he is not a stupid man. And he gives these Fidel Castro like uh, long orations on, you know, any and all topics about the Soviet economy, or rather the Russian economy, with great detail and precision. I mean, it's actually pretty impressive. It's, you know, he's somebody actually who has a hard work ethic, uh, but he he's cynical too at the same time. Uh, he thinks he understands something about human nature and that given the environment and the milieu that he came out of both growing up in terms of a tough neighborhood in uh, St. Peter Leningrad at that time, uh, and then, you know, seeing the collapse in the Soviet Union, that the view of young, talented Czechists, KGB, members of the KGB, was that the Communist Party was comprised of people who were both old and stupid. I mean, that's how they viewed them. And that they were in possession of this antiquated, archaic ideology that was destroying uh, Russia. And so many of them look back to the period of the uh, czars uh, and of the Stolpian uh, reforms and all the rest and the late czars period that if they would have just gone in that trajectory, everything would have been great and they could have carried on with this empire, you know, forgetting about things like the existence of nationalism and other messy things, which, you know, would have definitely blown this uh, uh, empire apart. So, you know, and Putin is a little bit guilty of that. He suffers from this delusion a little bit, not completely. Well, but but it's maybe maybe more than a little bit. I, the more I learn about Putin, the more he seems, at least in the last few years, unless it's kind of just to use it, but he seems to have internalized the, this toxic mix of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, nationalism, the historic mission of Russian civilization. They talk about now this, uh, they have to defend the state civilization that this is the Russia's real contribution to humanity, uh, to humanity, and going hearkening back to all the old old Russian emperors and 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 church. Oh, absolutely, and and they're using that uh, language now, civilizational states. I mean, that's what they're calling it, right? So yeah, they see, and Russia is. I mean, it is a civilization, but it, I mean, you know, he's a nuanced guy in a lot of ways, and so you're absolutely right. He's definitely gone in that direction, and. Especially since 2014, um, he's gone increasingly in that direction. But he's he hasn't been at the forefront of this. He's almost been kind of slowly pulled along. So, for instance, he's not been like Alexander Dugan, you know, who um, the U.S. press in 2014 proclaimed to be Putin's brain. Uh, and in fact, uh, because Dugan was making way too much noise about the need just to get this nonsense over and just take over Ukraine. Uh, uh, Putin fired her from his job at Moscow State University. He had him, you know, tossed to the curb. Uh, and then you have people like um, um, Igor Strelkov or Girkin, 
uh, the guy that was sent in by some part of the KGB to stir up trouble in the Donbass. The trouble was already there, but to you know, uh, encourage even more of it. A and then from Girkin's, uh perch in the Donbass, you know, where he sets himself up as the head of the the of the, uh, the uh, republic there, and then, uh, he wanted Putin also just to take over all of Ukraine. And by the end of 2014, Girkin or Strelkov, his, uh, his, his name that he gave himself, uh, you know, he makes too much noise about this and Putin yanks him out. You know, he says, no, we're, you know, we're not ready to take over Ukraine uh, right now. That's not the direction we should go. And so, you know, Putin has this different path, the Minsk agreements and all the rest. And he thinks that somehow the situation could be managed. At the same time, you know, I, I think the, and we'll get back to your original question. I think, I think the strategy of Putin has been one of slowly over time, bringing back all of the Russian speaking people into uh, Russia. But I think he has seen that it could be a slow evolutionary process where they would, of their own accord, wish to come back in. Now, of course, it hasn't worked that way at all. No, uh, but but you know, I think he thought that. Well, most of Ukraine, not you know, not the Galicians in the far west, which he doesn't, you know, he sees as, as quite different, and they are, you know, that oh, all right. Most of Ukraine, you know, it's it's not really. It's kind of a new invented country. Lenin caused all sorts of trouble, created this republic, and then those nationalist ideas really uh, uh, were fueled by this. And so, but I, I guess what I, what I'm asking is 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 there like the Israelis, the Israeli right, has this metaphysical conception that God has given the Jews from the river to the sea, uh, you know, uh, and that, it's, that it's, it's part of this God-given mission in defense of Jewish civilization, um, it, it seems like over time, Putin's come around to a vision of a God-given Russian civilization that has a right to this, uh, a Russia that's not within the Russian borders. And and that there's a metaphysical the metaphysical aspect to it at least the way it gets talked about. Yeah, I, I mean, and and again, it's figures like Dugan and others who have really talked about it in those terms. But there's a guy that I was just reading about this. You know this story about this Exodus, not Exodus. They in 1922, Lenin expels I think 200 uh, right wing intellectuals. Yeah, and they go to Germany, and which is interesting. He doesn't shoot them; he expels them. And they wind up living in Germany. And one of them, whose name I'm going to screw up and you're going to correct me, uh, I think his name was Ilya Ilyin. Am I, clo am, am I close? Brought back by Putin. Putin brings his bones exactly. back. It, well, exactly. The guy was, was essentially pro-fascist. He may have had some differences with Hitler, but on the whole, he wanted that kind of dictatorship in Russia. He was pro-Mussolini. And Putin brings his bones back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely clear, and this is what's so vexing about Putin. I mean, he, there, there's a lot of contradictions with him. Uh, so, you know, he's definitely adopted this kind of right wing nationalist uh, viewpoint, and these figures who, you know, I guess we can call them fascists or proto fascists, definitely for sure. And you know, at the same time, he presides over a country which he, because he's very much a pragmatist, which he knows is multi ethnic, and and is potentially a powder keg. And he also is very careful to say, hey, we are not a mono-ethnic nation state. We are the civilizational state. And, and we are fully open and welcome and accommodating to Muslims uh, and, to, and to other peoples. You know, so you know, one of the things that the Soviets did, of course, was they created both republics and then they created all of these um, autonomous regions. And so, you know, there are a dizzying number of ethnic groups within Russia. And so, you know, he, he wants to be careful not to uh, stir that pot. And, and he is careful not to do it. Um, but he also, you know, he's been saying things really during his entire uh, tenure in power, if, he, if one actually listens to him. He also understands that the Soviet Union, from his perspective, expanded too much. So he, he, he thinks that the whole project of the Warsaw Pact and all of that was too much. He, he, you know, he has flat out said that the Soviets were not liked by these people. They were not liked by the Hungarians. They were not liked by the Czechs. Uh, we should have never been there. It was too expensive, and it was politically ruinous as well. 
So contra this rhetoric about him wanting to restore the Soviet Union or the Soviet Empire, absolutely false. No, he, he understands that was a stupid idea. And he has said just that, that, you know, that, of course, you know, he has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest, uh, 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 you know, tragedy for uh, Russia. Uh, and yet at the same time, finishing the thought, he has also said that anyone who wants to bring it back is stupid. <laughs> that, you know, it, it, in its uh, uh, form. But, but he does see, in terms of Russian civilization, neighboring Russian-speaking populations should be in Russia. Even if the yeah. yeah no I mean no doubt about that and that's what I'm and that's what I'm saying is that I think what he wanted what he's getting is something different what he wanted was this kind of slow evolutionary process where he would bring in the Belarusians he would bring in uh, many of these Ukrainians who are really just Russians from you know his perspective uh, and in the Donbass a lot of them are not the majority but um, you know a lot but nonetheless from his perspective yes these are Russians and in Kazakhstan northern part of the country. Lots of Russians. So these are the kinds of people who would willingly, at some point, after Russia became more prosperous, you would be able to willingly okay, I'm gonna, bring them in. I'm going to jump to something which I kind of asked earlier, and then I I kind of sidetracked it. Now I'm going to get back to it. So where are we now in terms of the Putin, the state, and the relationship to the oligarchs? I, I read somewhere that it's ironic that the, the oligarchs that felt the sanctions the worst after the invasion, were actually the pro-Western oligarchs. And the and, and in some ways, it, it almost helped Putin because it weakened them and strengthened the oligarchs that are, were more closely aligned with Putin. But where is that relationship? Right. Uh, so that is what we saw very early in Putin's uh, rule, was this need to impose some order on the, uh, the Russian economy and to send a message uh, to the oligarchs that the state was going to reassert its power. And you may know the story. I mean, the way he did it was very dramatic. You know, he, he takes all of the chief oligarchs in the country. He invites them to a meeting at Stalin's old residence. Uh, so they're going to have a dinner. And you know, this, this residence is almost never used for anything. So it, it, it's sending a very strong message. He brings them out. And he tells them, uh, yeah, we're just going to be doing things a little bit differently. You can continue making your money. Uh, but if you get involved in politics, uh, that's a red line. Cross it at your para. And so for the most part, the oligarchs you know, listen to that, except for, of course, as we know, Mr. Kordakovsky, uh, who decides that he doesn't like this message and that he is a billionaire now and he does not have to uh, express this kind of uh, fealty uh, to uh, Putin's vision of uh, Russia. And so he finds himself eventually at a remote uh, airport at a re-landing, uh, being captured by a bunch of uh, FSB guys wearing ski masks and spends uh, quite a few years in jail before he's released. So that was the message that was sent there. But then slowly, speaking to what I was saying before about these KGB guys, now these KGB guys, again, remember, they were essential for providing those skills to these emerging uh, oligarchs in terms of using offshore banking and all the rest. And they felt really, really cheated uh, that they were completely left out of the grabbing uh, and that you know these hustlers who, as they were in a scene, who had no loyalty uh, to this idea of Russia uh, were allowed just to grab all of this uh, uh, state property and all of this wealth, and that the Czechs got cut up. So Putin, I think, was very sympathetic uh, to that argument. He didn't see the oligarchs as uh, very loyal to the state. And, you know, so he doesn't have a, a night of long knives and, you know, get rid of them all in one single shot. Uh, but, you know, he puts them on notice that either you become loyal uh, or else. And so over time, whenever... They find an opportunity to, you know, move someone out, one of these oligarchs, uh, especially ones that express any kind of independence, they will. And then they will replace them with one of these Siloviki, these old uh, FSB guys. Now, you know, FSB, they used to be KGB, that had been waiting in this queue 
they were all kind of promised uh, within the KGB, according to my Soviet Latvian uh, 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 source that I referenced uh, before. I, uh, they were all kind of promised their piece of cake. And, and so they start getting it. And so the Russian economy and state over time, you know, Putin usually doesn't act quickly. It is slowly transformed from an oligarch, these older 1990s oligarchs dominated economy, to one in which the Siloviki are now dominating. So they get all of these enterprises and they are moved in and they share uh, this vision that Putin has of a, a civilizational state. Uh, uh, but they also, you know, even though Putin comes from these very working class uh, origins, they see themselves as kind of an aristocracy, a new aristocracy, and uh, that uh, there's nothing that's not good enough for them. You know, so they, if they see a CEO of a, a Western company, you know, with a big mansion and a private jet and all the rest, well, then they should have two of that. <laughs> that you know, that none of this should be denied to them. And so they have uh, no compunction about uh, becoming big grabbers themselves. At the same time, at the same time, you know, Putin is not, again, he's not stupid. And so he, he understands that you need social stability as well. And so he also says to these guys, okay, much has been given to you, much is expected. So if I need you to uh, build a, a new um, soccer stadium in Smolensk, uh, in order to give youth something to do and not get into trouble politically and and or, you know, engage in various thuggery. I mean, let's try and provide people with some good standard of living. Then you're going to pay for that. So am I right to to think that then this newer group of oligarchs is far more beholden to Putin than the previous? Yeah, far more beholden and part of the same class. They have a similar background. Now, at the same time, you know, Putin is really unique in that he had so much uh, contact with the original oligarchs as well. So he knows them very well, but he's he's somebody who, you know, really is far more in tune with the Siloviki. And so he has slowly created this process in which he has replicated himself uh, throughout the elite of, uh, of, of Russia um, and and has gone closer to the military as well. And the military, again, has been very upset with the direction of that we see in Russia. And they represent rural uh, areas and they represent, I and mean, there's a, a geographic dimension to this. They, they they represent the cities outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg, and, you know, these industrial uh, uh, enterprises that are located within them. And they see themselves as, as I mean, there's, there's a lot of corruption there too, but they see themselves often as patriots and that, you know, again, the rest of the world led by the United States is out to get them. And uh, uh, that you know Russia should have been taking a more autonomous and uh, 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 firm uh, uh, direction in terms of its dealings with the West all along. And so that's a view that in the past ten years Putin has really adopted. Now we saw it as early as 2007, you know, and in 2008 with some of these speeches that he gave at some of these summits, in which he started to read the Riot Act to the United States. You know, you're causing all this trouble. You know, you, you, you know, you've more or less turned North Africa and the Middle East into uh, 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 into this chaotic um, uh, uh, area, and you know, hell, we're only some seven or eight hundred kilometers away from uh, from uh, Syria, and you know, you you've just set everything aflame, torched everything. Uh, you've done what you wanted. You haven't consulted with anyone, and now you're bringing NATO ever closer to us as well. We can argue how much NATO is responsible for the current, you know, war in Ukraine. But nonetheless, I mean, he's been talking about this for a long time, saying, you, you know, you can't just keep doing this. Uh, and of course, at one point, he wanted to, you know, Russia to become part of NATO, and he got rebuffed twice. So there's there's the, that dynamic as well. But slowly, so yes, yeah, slowly we've seen him evolve from somebody who I think actually wanted in a very kind of s cynical definition of the West, which is not entirely. Uh, without merit, you know, seeing it as okay, they've got you know, like in the United States, two political parties, but they're really not different at all, and they just collude and and represent a class of people that really runs everything. But it creates political stability. You know, they can change back and forth. 
I think he was playing around with that a little bit when he allowed Medvedev to uh, be uh, uh, president and then decided, nah, that's not going to work too well because now too many people are beginning to line up with him. And Now, we only have a few minutes left and clearly we could go on a long time and we should. We'll have to do some more segments. But let me just jump to one thing. Uh, last time I interviewed uh, Boris Kargalitsky, he was saying, this is just a, maybe a month or two before he was arrested. Um, he was saying that he thought that most of the oligarchs, uh, most of even the military leadership, didn't want this invasion of Ukraine um, and thought the whole thing was turning into a disaster. And if there was an alternative to Putin, they would want such, except that it, he didn't see that there, they don't see an alternative the person that can hold all these threads together because the fundamental problem is these oligarchs are not very quiet about their wealth and most of the Russian people are poor, especially outside the bigger cities. And that that conflict, that contradiction was getting more and more intense, people getting fed up with the wealth of the oligarchs. But Putin with the nationalist narrative, the the civilizational narrative, the the role of the, of the church, and so on and so on, I mean, he's able to hold it together. And even and in spite of what they thought was a, a disastrous decision to invade Ukraine, um, that there's no alternative to him. Um, and and if Boris is right about that, if you agree with that, but also. What's happened is the war has actually, so far, seemed to have actually strengthened Putin's hand because of the nationalist fervor he's been able to create. I don't know. What, what do you make of, of where Putin's at in relationship to, to the oligarchs, the military leadership? And, and you know, it, it, Ukraine might not be as big a shit show right now as it might have been, and it may still turn out to be, but still, it's not been a success story. Yeah, I mean, to my mind, the war has gone through several stages. I mean, there was the initial invasion, which uh, they completely botched, uh, and it was corruption that uh, helped in that. So, in other words, remember, you know, we had the uh, the FSB, which it, it very much looks like they were stealing the money that they were supposed to be using to bribe Ukrainian officials to just welcome <laughs> Russian uh, forces, uh, and then, of course, you know, the head of the uh, the FSB was you know put in. Uh, some detention for quite some time and then was eventually released. But, you know, and then we also have that meeting in which, you know, Putin is trying to show that there's this consensus for the invasion, right? So at the outset, so he brings all those officials in and it's clear he completely catches the head of the FSB off guard with all this, who, ex who almost is trying to express that, well, I don't, I'm not exactly sure about this. And we saw how sharp Putin was in his rhetoric. With it's a, it's an astounding moment. It's like he's, he's rebuking a high school student. Yeah, oh, no, exactly. Right, right, right. It was really quite incredible. So it's clear that this was a decision made by a very small group of people. And so it did not include many even very highly placed officials within uh, uh, the Russian state or you know, even with the oligarchs. So yeah, I, I think Many of the oligarchs, of course, are, they haven't been completely remade in terms of the Silovigi. So there are a lot of them that are just making lots of money. And yeah, they, they don't like this business of uh, what's happened uh, in Ukraine. Now, of course, the, uh, the war for Russia goes disastrously, disastrously at first. And it's clear that with just, you know, they, they sent a very small force in and they just thought they were going to topple uh, Kiev very quickly and then, you know, just impose a, another government. So they, they weren't trying to militarily take it over because they didn't have nearly the forces for that. Uh, they thought they were going to use this combination of bribery and shock. So that fails. And then, you know, and the negotiations break down in March and April. And then the Russians actually have some success in the summer of 2022. And then in the autumn, uh, there is that offensive that's launched by the Ukrainians, which leads to the Kharkiv region, you know, seeing the Russians driven out and also with uh, Kherson being divided. And so they really embarrassed the Russians militarily, the Ukrainians did. I mean, so they really, 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 you know, made them look very, very bad. And so it's clear for a while, yeah, this was looking really, really bad for the Russians. And, you know, presently, uh, the Russian's economy has done nothing 
like what the Western experts said would happen under sanctions. It did not implode at all. Uh, I think the, the Russians were really freaked out about the sanctions at first themselves, but they somehow managed to uh, ensure that this process was one that they could uh, adjust to, and they did. Uh, they, this counteroffensive of the Ukrainians has gone nowhere. Well, just on that, thanks to China and to some extent India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, but at the same time, it's not at all clear that Russia is going to be able to begin a new offensive either. I mean, so they have been uh, launching this you know, one attack in the, uh, in the Northeast, and they just lost a hell of a lot of armor, you know? So it, it, it looks, it, I mean, we don't know how it could turn out, right? Contingent variables always, you know, uh, scramble everything. But right now, it, it looks like a bit of a stalemate. Uh, but 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 what's happened is is that a lot of industry in Russia has recovered. A lot of it is pretty strong. There's starting to be some inflationary pressures because they don't have enough labor. Uh, in other words, like so many countries, uh, there's not a lot of young people, uh, and so um, you know those inflationary pressures are beginning to creep up. But they're really still quite small. Uh, while you know sanctions have actually, in some ways, uh, helped their economy. One of the things that Boris, referring to Kogorlitsky, uh, since you just did, one of the things that he used to say following 2014 was, please, more sanctions. <laughs> in other words, the Russian state is so weak and it has so little incentive to actually develop the country that the only way it's going to happen is if the West imposes sanctions and these sanctions can somehow begin to build up uh, Russian industry, which they did with agriculture following the 2014 EU sanctions. I mean, you know, Russia's agriculture was a mess, and because the EU sanctions them in 2014, they rebuild their agricultural sector. So, you know, Boris was like, "Oh, please, can we now have them on our industry, <laughs> and maybe we can rebuild this country's manufacturing sector?" So, uh, this appears to be a crisis that, at least right now, Putin has survived. He is not thriving, but that he has survived. All right. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. We got to con continue this. Uh, I do want to say, as we do this kind of analysis, uh, we're not forgetting the brutality of this attack on Ukraine and the, you know, the tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, Ukrainians, civilian soldiers, Russian soldiers. I mean, the, the brutality of this war. It's been World War One, like in its stupidity and uh, cruelty. It, 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 it's just horrific. And I don't. The thing I don't get, and I, I, I you know, you want you want to include all these Russian-speaking people in Russia and so on. A, a lot of the cities getting destroyed are Russian-speaking cities. Uh, it, the, I, I don't know what. That these people want anymore. I mean, before the invasion, maybe some of them did want to be in Russia. I don't know what the hell they would want now because uh, the place is just so destroyed. Anyway, that's a very good question. What would polling reveal today? It might be quite different. Than well, well, that's the only real legitimate resolution of this is, is legitimate, independently monitored referendums and let the people decide what they want. I mean, that should be the solution to all this. But if but why would the Russian state agree to a legitimately democratic solution there when they don't have one at home? And I got to say, the same thing goes for the Ukrainian oligarchy. Uh, since when have they been in, interested in a real democratic solution for Donbass or Crimea for them? I mean, they could have. I mean, you know, it, it, they could have had it with Minsk. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I can tell you, the Ukrainians will. And some of their arguments are quite legitimate. They'll say, "Well, all right, so the Russians have come in, and now that they've cleared out." Lots of the uh, Ukrainian sympathizers. Now you're going to hold a referendum? No. Well, well, you can, but but there have been UN held referendums in other places where people that have been have left or been expelled can still vote. You just have to prove you were living there before. I really doubt they're going to go for it, and it's it's it's, and I absolutely agree with you. It would be the the only way of resolving this mess. Well, just uh, just to say it again, uh, the, at their heart, the Ukrainian oligarchs aren't any better than the Russian, but this is not about the Ukrainian oligarchs. This is about an attack on the Ukrainian people, uh, who I hope when this is over, with all the guns they have, I would love to see them throw the Ukrainian oligarchs out of Ukraine and, and build a different kind of Ukraine. That 
I don't know if that's possible, but that would be a nice ending to all this. Okay, we're going to do this again because there's so much to talk about here. Uh, thanks again, Jeffrey. Oh, great to see you. And let me let me say to everybody watching and listening, because our actually our podcast platform is bigger than our YouTube platform, and or if they're watching on the website, uh, send in any questions you want for the next time we have this conversation, and I'll try to ask them. Uh, thanks again. Thank you for joining the analysis. We're getting near the year end. Uh, we are a 501c3 in the United States. Uh, we need donations to keep going. Uh, they are tax deductible. So as you're thinking about your year end giving, uh, please keep us in mind. Thanks for joining us.